Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Product Podcast Number Five. Uh, my name is Adi Bachpai, and I'm not alone here. I'm alongside Paul Condylis, who's AVP of Data Sciences at Tokopedia. A little bit about myself. I lead uh, promotion, selection, uh, demand, uh, and regional expansion at Tokopedia. I've been with the company for one and a half years. Uh, and today's podcast is going to focus on data sciences and its role and its impact on product management and product development in the future. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Paul Condylis to get us started. Paul, over to you. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm really excited to be here. So, uh, yes, I'm Paul. I'm AVP of Data Science in Tokopedia. And so I lead uh, many different areas of where data science is applied in Tokopedia. So I lead um, applying machine learning and data science in uh, physical goods, in logistics and fulfillment, uh, in forecasting, and lots of different areas of Tokopedia. So uh, I'm very excited to talk to you guys today. And uh, yeah, let's explore how data science is used in the real world and in Tokopedia. Great. Thanks, Paul. So to get us started, let's try to start from the, from the fundamentals, right? Let's start, let's start from the basics. What is data science? That's a really great question. So uh, I think it's also one that has been evolving over the years. So I think data science is really uh, an extension and has grown out of data analytics. So if you think about data analytics, it's all about uh, understanding data. And basically, data science is taking it to the next uh, level. So data science is all about uh, understanding data, using statistics to get a quantitative understanding of data, and then going beyond that and basically applying models so that we can predict values of the, you know, what's going to happen in the future. Um, so we try and understand with data science system behavior and make predictions in the future. So I think one of the biggest uh, things in data science that's different from data analytics is called machine learning. And this is where we use machines to look at data, understand from the data and learn from it about the how the system behaves, and then make predictions all on its own. So it learns about how to make these predictions without using any sort of human input. It just learns from the data. So I think this is one area where data science uh, sort of stands out over data analytics. Thanks, Paul. A lot of people I've worked with talk about, you know, how they've done analytics over the years, uh, you know, using Excel sheets or using other tools. Uh, in the context of, of, of that, of that thought process, uh, why do we need data science? How is data science different from what people have been doing uh, in the past? Yeah, great question. So I think data science is really, you know, this combination of programming in code, statistics, and modeling to make predictions about the future. So it really combines a lot of different areas. And the whole purpose is to use uh, machines to learn system behavior and then make predictions in an automated way. And these predictions can be used in your decision-making process. So if you have a, a process where you look at data and you try and out understand uh, certain outcomes, uh, and you're making decisions about what you should do next, given the information that you have, this is where machine learning can excel. It can learn patterns from the data and make decisions about what we should do in the future or make predictions about the world. And so this means that we can automate a lot of the decision-making processes that you would use you know, humans to do. So it's not that data science is going to replace human decision making, but it's really going to help us um, may, maybe automate some of the things that are we need less intelligence for so that humans can really focus on the hard things. So, for example, um, you know, data science um, can be used. I think one of the first examples of data science being used in machine learning was looking at uh, cats on the Internet. So I think this was an experiment from Google. Basically, they um, downloaded a lot, of, a lot of images and they wanted to know, is this a cat or is it not? And so it's a funny application, but they built a machine learning model to do this. 
And so they were able to create a model where, you know, they could say, the model was able to say, oh, yes, this is a photo of a cat, this is a photo of a dog, this is a photo of a horse, etc. This is really easy for humans to do, but really hard for computers to do until machine learning came about. So it means that if you had a process where you're looking at images, now you can automate some of that. So then you can use human brain power, which is much more sophisticated on more difficult challenges. And, and what does this mean to real world problems that, that you know, people are trying to solve? How does the emergence of data science change our perspective and our point of view uh, and our problem solving process when it comes to the real world? Can you, can you help us understand that a little more? Yeah, maybe I can give some examples of how machine learning and data science is being used. And maybe you're not even aware of these things. So let's say that you're buying uh, something on, on a website. And basically, there are sellers that are uploading um, things that you know people want to buy. And so if a seller uploads an image of a, of a dress, it's quite easy for a human to look at the item and say, yeah, this is a, a female fashion dress for the summer catalog. Very easy for us with our visual understanding to like look at the image and immediately get the answer that we're looking for. Actually, nowadays, machine learning is being used to automate this process. So it basically is running behind the scenes. And when you upload a picture, we can run models that basically say, okay, this looks like a a dress, so it looks like FEMA fashion. Uh, it looks like it's uh, from uh, clothing and dresses, and it looks like a summer dress. So this is basically a process then that can be automated because of machine learning. So other areas where this is you know, being applied is, let's say that you are searching for something on the internet. When you type in your search query into you know, your favorite search engine, it will run a series of models that try and un understand your query. So it will uh, try and first of all understand like what are the categories that you're interested in from the query text. Uh, and then it will uh, try and augment your query, maybe correct some of the spelling errors that you've made, or maybe add some information. And then using that extended uh, query, we'll then look through the Google catalog and match it to uh, websites. And so all of this process is basically machine learning in practice. And it all happens within a fraction of a second and you know, happens seamlessly without you knowing about it. Uh, so data science is really being applied in many areas, sort of behind the scenes, and you don't even realize. Um, so nowadays we have amazing capabilities in machine learning. So for example, machine learning can be used in decoding speech and turning it into text, so speech to text. Uh, it can, as we talked about earlier, it can be used to recognize images and what's the object in the image. Like, is this a cat or is it a dog or is it an airplane? Uh, it can be used to answer questions about uh, a document, so it can understand the document or let's say read a document and then based on a question that you have it can answer that question for you by basically looking up the relevant information in the document. Uh, this is uh, some capability that's called natural language processing. Um, also there are other processes that are really like revolutionary these days which is that data, uh, machine learning models can actually now generate photorealistic artworks from a prompt. So if you say uh, the moon uh, is shining down on a mountainside with a snow-covered peak and a forest of pine trees near a, a river, you can imagine this scene. Now machine learning models can generate you an image of this scene that doesn't exist anywhere in, on Earth, but it can generate a photorealistic um, image. All right. Thanks, Paul, uh, for that detailed explanation of why we need data science. Uh, now, in the context of what's happening with data science and machine learning today, 
the boundary between what humans can do and what machines can do is sort of blurring. So how do we decide what problem is a data science solvable problem and what is not? Uh, and what, what are the criteria uh, which we should evaluate? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I think, you know, the data science uh, project life cycle goes a little bit like this. So first of all, we evaluate the problem at hand and the data that's available to us. Once we've understood the data, that's where we can really understand like, okay, what are the available solutions that we can use to solve this problem? Typically, uh, there are things that can be done and things that just can't be done just yet. And these things are changing all the time. So um, some things that can be done right now is, uh, uh, you know, image understanding. So taking an image and using machine learning algorithm to basically automate a decision or a prediction about that image. Uh, other things that can be done are on images again are like detecting objects within an image uh, maybe removing the background, or even like making the uh, image of a higher resolution automatically with a machine learning model. Other things that can be done are in the space of uh, natural language processing are really, if you have a document, then we can understand uh, the document and ask questions about it and automatically generate responses using machine learning model. I think what's currently sort of out of the realm of, of uh, small models or uh, out of the realm of data science not being done in big companies is more when you go into like uh, maybe developing language models uh, yourself. So, uh, you know, language models that understand documents are built on millions of documents. And so if you did not have that information available, you wouldn't be able to create your own language model. So uh, it really, uh, to answer your question, it's, it really depends on the problem and the amount of data that's available and also the computational resources that you have at hand. If you don't have too much data and not a lot of computational resources, most likely uh, machine learning models may not be able to help you too much. But it, it, there are some nuances there as well. Got it, got it. And, and for us professionals, right, uh, what, I mean, for, you know, for us product managers especially, what kind of data science models uh, do we need to be aware of? Uh, what are the different types of data science or machine learning terminologies and models and, uh, you know, frameworks uh, that are important for us to be aware of? Great question. I think there are a couple of different areas of machine learning specifically that have some Term, terminology that are as in, is important to understand the differences. So in general, we learn from data, and there are two different ways that machine learning models learn from data. There's something called supervised learning, and there's something called unsupervised learning. And they're quite distinct, but easy to understand. So supervised learning is when we have a data set and we know the outcome that we're looking for. So for example, Let's say that we uh, have collected uh, uh, 10,000 images from the internet and there's been a human that's labeled all of them. And they've labeled them that, you know, this is, uh, let's say, a cat, this is a dog, this is an airplane, this is a horse. And this is none of those. So basically, if we have that data set, then we apply models where we uh, have a supervision it means that we have the result, the label from the human. And so using this, we can use, uh, we can build models called supervised uh, models. And basically that means that after we build this model, we can use it to uh, predict on new images. So if you then send me an image that the model hasn't seen before, there's a very high chance that we'll get it right. Um, then, on the other side, there's this unsupervised learning. And this is where we have no information about the outcome that we're looking for. Uh, for example, let's say that, again, we're looking to classify uh, images of dogs, cats, uh, horses, and airplanes. 
uh, uh, but we don't have any information that tells us that this photo is, is a dog, this photo is a cat. In this case, we use unsupervised learning techniques where we try and the machine learning itself tries to understand the differences between these uh, pictures and it will then cluster them into different groups. And then basically at the end, you know, you can look at these different clusters and hopefully in one cluster you'll have all of the horses, in another cluster you'll have all of the cats, and another one you'll have the dogs and so on. So this is an example of unsupervised learning. So there are these two training methodologies that are a little bit distinct. And, um, you know, in most of the problems, I would say that we solve on a regular basis and many companies solve. It's more on the supervised learning side. Unsupervised learning is a little bit more tricky, more difficult. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of companies are um, can get value from the supervised learning. Um, process. Got it, Paul. Another term that we that we hear uh, in the context of machine learning and data science is something called neural networks. Can you help us understand a little bit about what neural networks are? It just sounds too cool. Uh, and, you know, I mean, people just use neural networks all the time around me. Uh, it would be great to understand from, from an expert what exactly it is and how does it help, of course, you yeah, so neural networks are definitely very cool if you're a nerd like me. Um, so basically, a neural network is a specific type of data science machine learning model architecture. And basically, there are many different types of neural network. But if we break them down, basically, uh, in each neural network, they're composed of nodes. And each node is called a neuron. It's kind of similar to your neurons in your brain in terms of the concept, not in terms of how they work. But basically, each neuron is looking for a specific type of pattern. And if it sees that pattern, it activates. It says, yes, I've seen this pattern. Uh, and basically, if you have a lot of them chained together, then basically each of them is trying to recognize a different part of the pattern. Then basically, on another level up, they all like say, yes, I saw this pattern. No, I didn't see the pattern. And basically on the next level, we have another set of neurons and they look for uh, more higher level patterns. And basically by adding more and more layers of these neurons or these individual pattern recognizers, you're able to recognize more complex patterns. Say the um, pattern of uh, you know, what an object in a, a photo looks like. So you're able then to look at cats and uh, maybe some of the neurons are looking for certain types of line in the image. Maybe other neurons are looking at the colors, uh, things like this. So basically, by adding all these layers of uh, pattern recognizers, that's basically what a, a neural network is. Got it. Okay. Thanks for the deeper understanding on what neural networks are. I'm going to take us back to what you mentioned about supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And a question there was uh, that I had in my mind was, the so supervised learning, let's say we had, uh, uh, you know, the system can identify whether a photo is a cat's photo or a dog's photo or a horse's photo. And let's say the system makes a mistake. In supervised learning, how do we maintain or improve the precision or accuracy of prediction in a system? That's a good question. So it really depends on the circumstance. So in general, there are a couple of different ways to improve model performance. One of them is if you're training the model and you see it's rapidly improving each iteration, uh, you're showing it new data, it's rapidly improving, it probably means that you just need to add more data to make it continue on that learning path. If you see another situation where the model, uh, as you add more data in the training, basically it's flat, the performance isn't really improving anymore. It means that probably you need to improve uh, the complexity of your model so it can you know, add more uh, functionality to your model so it can understand more complex behavior. So these are the two general uh, knobs that we have at our disposal. In one situation, we just add more data because uh, neural networks love um, lots of data. And in the other case, we need to look at the architecture itself and maybe make the architecture more complex 
so that we can extract all of the uh, features in the um, in the data itself. Got it. Okay. One of the things that you mentioned was lots of data, and and it's important because to to understand from a product management perspective, what do you mean when you say lots of data? Like how much data are we talking about here? Yeah. Good question. So. Um, I think let's cast our minds back to 2012. And in 2012, something um, something happened that changed the world forever. Basically, in 2012, there was a competition called ImageNet competition. And basically, it was to um, uh, participants were asked to build models that would classify images in one class or another, as we've been talking about. Uh, and basically, at that point, statistical methods were, you know, from data analytics were, you know, the go-to thing that you would do is uh, handcraft features from the image and then use a statistical uh, model to recognize the class. But in 2012, what happened was that the data set that was used was huge. It had millions of images. And in this case, a machine learning model for the first time, outperformed all other methods by a massive margin. And so at that point revolutionized the world in saying that, okay, yeah, machine learning has come of age. Now it can outperform other, other um, tasks when we have a lot of data. So in that experiment, they had a data set of millions of images, all of them labeled with the class. So uh, back in back in that time, you know, you would need millions of data. Now I think we've evolved somewhat. So um, you can actually do something called transfer learning, which basically we take uh, a model that's been trained on massive amounts of data that you had from downloading images off the internet, for example, and then we fine tune it for your task on a smaller data set. And this smaller data set could be, you know, a thousand uh, images of a dog to recognize dogs uh, and so on. So basically, instead of needing millions of images, now basically you use that as a resource to train a, a pre-trained model and then you fine tune it on your data. So instead of needing millions of images these days, now you can get by with a thousand images, maybe 10,000 in in the worst case. And in some cases with very advanced models, uh, which are pre-trained on massive amounts of data, uh, you can actually get away with just, you know, 10 to 100 images instead. So it, it depends on the complexity of the model that you're using uh, and the task. If there's a data set that you can use that someone's already created for you, then most likely you can use that data set with even maybe not even adding any data yourself. Um, but yeah, for most tasks, let's say I need to recognize pictures for um, a use case in Tukopedia, then I would say, yeah, we need around a thousand images per class. Understood, got it. Well, thanks for that detailed explanation of, of, of data and how much data we need. And speaking about data and continuing to talk about data, because data is such an important component of, of data science and, and machine learning, how much of your time actually... The, the, okay, here's the context of the question. A lot of data in the world is not structured. A lot of data in the world is literally data out there. It doesn't exist in a structured database, completely cleaned up, ready to use, you know, perfect data. You and I have had experience multiple times about this. Even data in databases is, is, is not, you know, ready to use uh, many times uh, as, as we have seen in the last in the last uh, one and a half years. How much of your time goes into kind of just getting the right data, getting the data, oh, sorry, not getting the right data, but getting the data right for, for data science? Did, did I, yeah? This is a really fantastic question because in fact, a lot of people misunderstand where data scientists spend their time. Most of the time, it's not on the model. The, you know, there are lots of models that you can actually just get off from the internet, open source models that other people have made and contributed on the internet. Uh, I think that the uh, majority of data scientists spend their time on 
cleaning the data, under, well, first of all, understanding the data, what is inside this data set that we have. Uh, they then clean the data. This can be like removing uh, noise. So, for example, if you're trying to do image recognition, but you have an image that really isn't recognizable even to a human, then most likely, you know, machine learning model is not going to learn anything from this image. So you can just remove it from the data set. Um, so, yeah, a lot of uh, time is spent like automating the process of removing uh, invalid data. And then another process that takes a long time is called feature engineering. And feature engineering is really the next step where you try and uh, understand, okay, from this data, what are the important aspects of it? And can I develop a feature that tells me about that important aspect? And then from these features, the machine learning uh, algorithm is able to learn quicker and is able to be more precise because it really looks at these key features that are inside the data. So I think in this whole process of pre-processing the data and creating features, which is called feature engineering, it actually takes most of the data science time. Modeling then happens. Uh, it's iterative in nature. So it means that after you've made a model, you look at some errors that the model produces, and then you go back to the data cleaning. Maybe you've identified some more noisy data. You can get rid of that. Or maybe you've identified some of the labels that were labeled by human are actually wrong. Maybe there are some mistakes. And so you want to relabel that data. And another thing that we, um, that we often do is basically, OK, so we see that these features are not particularly useful. The machine isn't learning. So let's think about some more features that might be important by looking at the errors that the machine learning model is making. So this is an iterative um, feedback loop. And it means that you know, data science is not a linear process. It actually has loops. And uh, yeah, but a lot of the data science time is actually um, going into understanding the problem, understanding the data, cleaning the data, and doing this feature engineering. Great. Thanks, Paul. Let's stick with the data and feature engineering a little bit. Uh, for our listeners, would it be possible for you to give like a real-world example of feature engineering and the techniques uh, used in data science to, to arrive at you know, the right set of features for, to, to help solve the problem? Hmm, good question. So maybe let me think about a problem that we've been trying to solve that's relevant. So one of the problems that we try and solve in Tokopedia is trying to match whether two products are actually describing the same product. Let's say that we have two product listings. Uh, one is a, a, some sort of brand of milk that's uh, 100 milliliters, and another one says it's a, a brand of milk, uh, it's 150 milliliters. Or uh, maybe the spelling is different and it says, it spells out milliliters and in the first one it's ML. So one of the features that you could engineer is basically, okay, let's extract all of the numerical values from each side and then we can just compare those directly. So one feature could be extracting all of the numerical values one feature could be extracting the brand value. Another feature could be extracting some other part of the text. And by, by basically extracting these things ahead of time, it simplifies the problem a little bit because instead of the model having just to decode the string, it now has some extra information that, oh, these are the numbers that are important or we think are important. These are the uh, parts of the string of the text that we think are important. So feature engineering is all about extracting information and encoding it in a different way and making a new input channel to the model. Got it. Great. Thanks, Paul. Let's, let's come closer to, uh, closer to our experience with, with data science over the last one and a half years. One of the projects you know, in which we collaborated and we are still collaborating is uh, on promotions optimization. So uh, you know, the business definition, I remember uh, when we started this project, Last year, uh, February 2021, uh, the business deficit definition uh, was fuzzy, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so we came 
uh, the business. I, I I was the I was the lead on the on the product side, and I remember we came to you to discuss uh, the possibility of being able to optimize cash back uh, to our customers, which basically at a high level meant, hey, can we decide which customer gets a promotion, which customer doesn't get a promotion, and of the customers that get a promotion, which is cash back, how much do they get? Uh, and although we, we, you know, it was sort of a one line problem statement or maybe a two line problem statement, what happened was a one and a half year collaboration and a very, very successful outcome. So why don't you walk us to uh, your side of the world, the data science side of the world uh, on, you know, on, on how, how you approached the problem, how you solved it and uh, the amazing impact you've had. Uh, for Tokopedia in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of optimization. Yeah, this this was a really interesting project um, because it has a really direct impact on the business and also has a direct impact on our customers. And we try and make the customer experience as good as we can make it. And so I guess the problem boils down to, as you were saying, like which users should get which coupons? What is the best coupon for for you today when you're shopping? And so uh, there are a myriad of possible solutions. And I think the first solution that we came to was using like a data analytics uh, statistical approach to um, think about, okay, uh, applying some rules to who gets which coupons. And then from this baseline, we, we started building a machine learning approach to this problem. And so I think what we decided on what a solution we thought was best was to uh, look at what is the flow for deciding, you know, which customer should get what which coupon. Basically, what we did first was let's calculate a baseline for each customer that's coming to shop, and basically let's try and figure out, okay, how likely are is this customer going to buy something today? And uh, if you're likely to buy something, how much are you going to spend? So if we're able to calculate these things, then basically it gives us a baseline. For this customer, they're going to come and they're likely to be browsing and maybe they're not going to spend anything today. Uh, or this customer, he's browsing and he looks like he's going to uh, has a high likelihood of purchasing. And also his basket size is, uh, you know, maybe larger than than others. And so from this, we're able to take this baseline and then calculate for each coupon. So let's say we have a cashback coupon of 10% cashback. Maybe we have cashback coupon of 1% cashback, 4%, whatever the um, configurations are of minimum spend and the cashback um, percentage discount. Basically for each of them, we calculate the uh, over the baseline again. So we say, Okay, if I give this customer this coupon, what is uh, his predict? What is the likelihood he's going to buy? He's going to purchase something, and what is the likelihood that his basket size is going to be of a certain amount, or what his what is his basket size going to be? And so then we're able to calculate using these predictions. Okay, the baseline was here, and then this customer is if we give him this coupon, he's going to spend much more than he would if we gave him this coupon. And so from this, we're able to calculate then for all of the customers, what are the, you know, what is the best coupon for them to, you know, encourage them to buy the things that they need and, you know, buy them from Tokopedia. And so how do we, how do we create these models? This is called an uplift model. Basically, we calculate this difference between the baseline and the uh, what happens when we give a treatment? What happens when we give a coupon? And so how we come up with these estimations of your uh, purchase probability and also your basket size is by looking at your past behavior. So how have you interacted with Tokopedia before? And specifically, how have you interacted when there have been coupons? So we look at your behavior of uh, purchasing without coupons, and we look at your behavior with purchasing with coupons of different configurations. And then we're able to use this information and basically build this machine learning model that takes millions of rows of data 
and then compresses it down into these couple of predictions. And then the final process is, okay, now we know the uplift for each customer, for each coupon, then we can optimize. We only have a certain budget, uh, unfortunately. So it means that, you know, given our budget, what's the best that we can do for our customers? And so then we can run an optimization algorithm that basically tries to say, okay, for this budget, this is the best allocation um, that will give us the maximum um, spend for our customers that are able to buy more things on Tokopedia. So that's kind of in a nutshell how we went through the process of creating a model for promotion optimization. Um, you know, within that, of course, there's a myriad of things that, uh, you know, we had to do. Of course, Paul. And, and, and that's where I want to kind of take the discussion because uh, for the mathematically inclined uh, in, 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 in the listening audience, uh, would it be possible for you to kind of outline the different models and different techniques and algorithms that uh, that you experimented with, that you explored at a high level, of course, without disclosing any uh, any confidential uh, information about about the about the whole process? Yeah, great question. So uh, I'd love to go through all the details, but I think some of them are uh, more confidential. So we'll go through the ones that are uh, at a high level. Uh, what we did. And uh, as I was saying before, like um, in our previous um, discussion about the process of data science and where we spend our time, it really is not on the modeling side. And in this case, it's true also. We spent a lot of time on the feature engineering side. So that means that when we took the data, we, you know, we look at user behavior. So it means that we look at what you're clicking on, uh, what you purchased in the past, what um, you know, basket size have you had and what coupons have you interacted with? And so from this, we actually, you know, engineered, I think, something like 200 or 300 different features from this data. And so from these features, we then run a calculation on, okay, out of these hundreds of features, what are the most important ones? Can we rank the features for their importance um, given the, you know, what are the important features for making the maximum uh, precision or accuracy of the model? And so, yeah, basically we run this feature optimization uh, approach where we try and select the most impactful features, then we tune the model given those features, and then we go uh, back again and we say, okay, uh, it looks like we need more features on the user behavior side. Uh, so let's make some more features about um, what they click on. Maybe also let's look at how long they spend on the PDP page, on the product detail page. Let's look at, you know, uh, whether or not they clicked on that by mistake. Maybe they clicked on an image of a product, but then went back again. So maybe we don't count that. So through this process of like iteratively figuring out what are the most important features and removing some of the data that we didn't need, we're able to refine the model. So some of these features are looking like um, you know, what did the user click on? Uh, how many PDPs did the user click on today? How many PDPs did the user click on in the last week, in the last 30 days, and so on? Uh, what was the basket size in the last seven days, in the last 30 days, and so on? These are important because, let's say if you're shopping regularly, uh, and basically, you know, you're, you're spending on a regular basis, it means, okay, that feature can be important for predicting your basket size. But in another shopper, maybe they spend, uh, you know, at the end of the month, they spend a certain amount of money, and then they don't come back until the next end of the month, and then they spend again. So these features can really give us information about, you know, today, what is the likelihood that that buyer is going to spend, you know, given their seasonal behavior. So using this engineering, a feature engineering approach, we really try and drill down into, you know, uh, what are what is the user behavior telling us uh, in terms of like uh, how likely they are to make a purchase or what their basket size might be. So in terms of the modeling, it's really, uh, you know, the models are actually quite simple, I would say. It's more the data engineering and the feature engineering that's important there. Great, great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, just you know, uh, another question. Uh, when you started describing 
uh, you know, what we did in promotion optimization, we basically mentioned that, hey, we started solving it using data analytics, and then we moved on to data science. The question I had was, do all data science problems actually start from data analytics, or uh, can we just jump over data analytics and go straight to data sciences now? Good question. So I think in a lot of problems, it's really useful to set a baseline. And so that baseline can be set by what you've been doing already. That can set your baseline of what's going on now. And then, you know, machine learning is there to try and outperform that baseline. So by giving us that uh, that baseline, we're able to look at how effective are our models and basically simulate, okay, if we employed our model, will it shift that baseline? Is it getting better? And so if you're, uh, you know, if you don't, if it's a totally new area, then it's important to be able to set that baseline. And data analytics is often the, you know, the first thing that you go to, to set something simple. So it can be, um, for example, in our chatbot, we try and help customers answer their questions. And one of the things that we do before even the user enters a session is we try and predict what are they likely to ask us about today. And so a baseline there can be that, okay, let's just use statistics to understand what are the frequently asked questions, and then we can set these as uh, the likely uh, the likelihood of different questions being asked. And that can set us the baseline. And then our machine learning model is then trying to predict uh, in a better way for this customer what are they likely to ask? And so the base, we try and outperform that baseline. So yeah, baseline uh, data analytics is often used when you uh, are in a new area and you have no way of setting out, you know, you know where we are now and what can we do. It basically gives you a platform to say, okay, if we apply a machine learning model, we can do five percent better than the just using statistics. Uh, in some examples, machine learning doesn't improve. And then you, you can just use simpler statistics just to be the thing that you, you code in production. Great, great. Thanks, Paul. All right, moving on, to, uh, uh, moving on from the technicalities of data science to the implications of data science on, on product management, on product management processes. Can you help us understand from your point of view, how does data science and data science, data sciences, machine learning, how does this whole new world impact product development, product development processes, product development thinking, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's, that's the first question. And the second question would be, uh, how should product managers be thinking about the future in terms of their knowledge base, their skill set, uh, and their mindset, uh, as, as, as you know, data sciences and machine learning take more and more importance? Yes, great question. So I think let's go through one by one. <laughs> so on the first uh, question, it's about the processes that um, we're used to and maybe the uh, normal product manager is used to you know, following a certain methodology. And there are different methodologies, of course, that people follow. So there's the uh, so-called waterfall approach, where basically you try and plan out everything from the finest detail in advance. You try and basically plan out that this is exactly all of the steps that we're going to follow in a process to get from A to B, what we are looking to get to. A waterfall is, uh, is great when you can really map out in fine detail all of the processes that you need. Um, But actually, nowadays, we follow a more agile approach. And data science can fit into this agile approach more easily. So one of the drawbacks of a waterfall approach is that, yeah, basically, you need to know all of the contingencies for every single dependency and every outcome of all of the steps. But in data science, you may not know all of the outcomes in advance. So there's a lot of uh, iterations in data science, a lot of loops where you uh, look at the problem, you uh, clean the data, you label the data, you go into the feature engineering, and then you do the model, you evaluate, and then you go have to go back and you say, okay, maybe I need to relabel my data, I need to clean the data, I need to engineer our features, 
and then go back to your modeling and evaluation, go back again. And you keep going in this loop until you get the outcome that you're looking for. This doesn't work within the waterfall framework because there's no scope for iterating. There's no scope for experimenting. You have to know everything in advance. There's another methodology which is called Agile. And basically Agile is more iterative in nature. Basically, you try and do things quicker. You try and say, okay, for this week, I want to have this outcome. And then basically at the beginning of the week, you make a plan and then you run an experiment to see if you can get the outcome that you need. And then you refine. And so um, basically in a sprint process, normally software engineers, uh, software engineering can be quite linear. So you can plan out, okay, in this section of time, I'm gonna do this much, I'll have achieved this. And then we go to the next sprint. And in this section of time, I can complete the rest of it. And so it can be very linear. Uh, within the Agile approach. Data science needs to be a bit more flexible where we say, okay, we're going to need to run a series of experiments to learn what is important and to learn about how to solve this problem using machine learning. And so it means that there can be iterations. So instead of following this linear process in the first approach, we say, okay, in this week, we're going to run this experiment and we're going to see uh, either we build a model and we evaluate it to see whether or not these features were um, good enough for us. And then basically in the next step, we would um, try and build some other features. And basically we keep going, building more features. Or it could be that maybe we built a model and we want to run an experiment on our users to see how effective is our model in production. And basically then, you know, with the, given the results of that experiment, we can then go back and say, okay, I need to tweak my model. So I think for um, managers, maybe product managers can be used to and understand the software engineering aspect of building code to solve a problem, but they, and, and that can be quite linear, but for uh, when data science is involved, it needs to be more uh, experimentative. We uh, basically, product managers need to be aware that, you know, we need to run certain experiments to be able to iterate uh, quickly. So they may not, we may not be able to say precisely that this, to get this outcome, we need this amount of time. We can say, okay, we're going to run these experiments within this time frame to learn what we need to know to build the perfect model. And so um, oftentimes also, Product managers are not used to having maybe setbacks. Um, maybe, you know, one experiment failed. We didn't get the expected result. So, you know, there we need to brainstorm a little bit. Does this mean that we can't solve this specific challenge or does it mean that we need to tweak something along the, along the way? So in this uh, process, we need product managers to be involved with the data scientists to like in the iterations to be there to basically guide us in terms of what's important, you know, um, did, is this a road blocker? You know, what does this mean for the project? Whereas in normal software engineering, uh, you know, it doesn't happen so frequently and it's more of a linear process. So I think the major thing for product managers to be aware of when they're interacting with data scientists is it's a work in pro progress always and it's, um, you know, as good as your last experiment. So being able to think of new experiments is really helpful. And to your second question, which is, you know, how how can the how can product managers be preparing for the future and what should they expect? That's a really great question. I think that we can expect machine learning to start to be used in more and more areas of um, in products where it hasn't been used before. Uh, and that's because the capabilities of machine learning models is getting better because we're getting more data, uh, we're getting cleaner data, we're able to, you know, use the history of now 10, 20 years of data science and really build on top of it. So it means that, you know, 
10 years ago, I couldn't build a language model to ask, answer questions about a document. Or in Tokopedia terms, I couldn't expect a model to be able to answer user questions about a specific product. Does this product have this feature? You know, are these headphones noise cancelling or are these regular headphones? Uh, you know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't be able to use a machine learning model to answer these questions. Now we can. So now I can train models on uh, text about products and it can read the text and say, yes, these headphones have noise cancelling. Or it could be answering user questions in chatbot or it could be, you know, basically any product we should expect that we'll be able to use data science in one aspect of that product or maybe all of it and so i think for product managers it's uh, good for them to interact with their data science colleagues because we can tell them or we can advise them what's possible today and what might be possible tomorrow Great, Paul. I think it's, it's, it's been a great conversation trying to understand, you know, the history of data science, what data science is, uh, why is it important for us, why is it needed, uh, some real-world examples, uh, Tokopedia case study, uh, and, you know, what do product managers need to do to be prepared for the future. Any last comments from you or for our audience who's, I'm sure, super interested in product management and data science? Yeah, so... I think data science is being used more and more in Tokopedia and in other companies. And in Tokopedia, we use it in so many areas of the product experience. We try and make it better for our customers. Every day we're asking, how can we make this process easier for our merchants? How can we make this uh, easier for, buy uh, for buyers to purchase what they're interested in? So we're using it in search, we're using it in recommendations, we're using it in understanding uh, when sellers are uploading an image, trying to decode that image. We're using it uh, basically in every process that um, Tokopedia has in our product features. And so what we can expect for the future is that a bright future of machine learning, making it easier for you to buy products on Tokopedia, making it easier for sellers to upload their products and basically you know, hopefully get more sales. So I think the future is bright and um, stay tuned. Great. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks thanks for your time and thanks to the audience for listening. Uh, if you have any more questions, reach out and we're happy to have a chat. Uh, but for now, I think uh, from Paul and I, uh, have a nice day, stay safe and keep shopping on Tokopedia. Thanks, guys.